Hi, I'm Orna Walters. And I'm Matthew Walters. And thanks for joining us today for Head versus Heart. How do you choose your beloved? I know from my own experience, I struggled very much with this. My head knew somebody was good for me or not good for me, and my heart just did whatever it wanted, and they were very rarely in alignment. Exactly. So we got a lot of really great new content for everybody today, and we're really excited about this new webinar. So we're just going to dive right in. I'm going to start by bringing up the slides. Well, that's interesting. Where are the slides? Share screen. There we go. Okay, so here we are, head versus heart, how to choose your beloved. So first, let's just you know get to know you and where you guys are coming from. So please share in the box, type into the chat box where you are in the world, let us know your location, maybe let us know what you're looking to get out of today's webinar. Yeah, we wanna know where you are. Um, we, know, we have a ritual before we start any sort of webinar or teleclass or anything. and we want to connect our hearts to yours. So if you can let us know where you are, we can visualize where you are in the world. So we want to see where you are. Wow, we have people from all over. We've got both Buffalo, New York. We have Nebraska, Palm Desert. Ireland. Uh, New York again. Ontario. We have, oh, Canada. Las Vegas. <laughs> West Virginia. I love it. Thank you for sharing. I'm picturing our hearts connecting with yours where you are all over the globe. That's very important Pittsburgh, for us. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. All right. We got lots of people from all over the place. Thank you everyone for sharing that and yeah. for joining us today. I mean, we're really excited. You know, we, we really put a lot of time and effort into these webinars because we want to make sure that you guys get as much benefit as you can from the content we have to offer. So why don't we dive right in? Uh, let's see. There we go. So you are in the right place joining us today if you are successful in every area of your life except long lasting love. You find it easier to focus on your career because you know how to get results there. Yeah, you're either attracted to someone who's not available in some way, or you do your best to settle for the guy who's crazy about you, even though you're kind of mm, meh about him. You're in the right place today. If you can identify your limiting beliefs and bad strategies and love and relationship, but you have no idea how to actually change them. You're in the right place if you feel you have so much love to give. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be someone to receive it from you. And you're in the right place today if you feel like you've tried everything, you have all the information, but what you're really looking for is a transformation. Yeah, and maybe, you know, you've completely given up and decided that you're just meant to be all alone in this world, that maybe in this life that what was it meant to be for you. Yeah, and I think you wouldn't be here joining us today if you've completely given up. So I think uh, maybe there's a glimmer of hope. I hope we can light that spark of hope and make it into something much more than just a hope and a wish and a prayer and give you some actual steps you can take. Exactly. All right. Head versus heart. How to choose your beloved. So, you know, we're going to talk a lot today about what criteria that you are using to choose love. I mean, do you do you think about it? Do you have like a, a big long list of criteria that you're looking for about how tall he is and how much money he makes and what kind of car he what drives, kind of car he drives <laughs> right? Do you just go off a feeling and you just know deep down inside you feel like, oh, this person's my soulmate. I know it. Even though all the signs around you are showing you that the guy's not available and he's not interested. Yeah, and I just want to say today, we are speaking to women, so we will be speaking in that way, but if there's some men who snuck in here and you're listening to us today, some of this will apply to you. It'll just be, you know, you'll have to make a pronoun switch in your head. So we're going to be talking to the ladies out there, um, mostly because we find that women really struggle when they're successful in their career arena. Um, they seem to have less success in their love and lasting relationships and that men have similar issues, but they don't show up the same way. So if you're a man who snuck in to listen to us, feel free to keep listening. Just know that we're going to be speaking as far as pronouns go. We're going to be speaking to the women out there who are looking to meet the one and that one is a man. 
And you know what, ladies, if you like to date ladies and men, if you like to date men, it's, you know, we're all human beings. We're going to be talking a little bit about the human condition. So it will apply. Just make the pronoun switch in your head if you need to. Awesome. All right. So we want you to take a moment and think about how you've been choosing. How have you been choosing love? And has it been working for you? Do you choose from your heart and go with a feeling? Do you do you try to rationalize and try to make it work with somebody where there isn't that energetic attraction to? Do you not trust either your head or your heart and you just kind of feel lost and you just wonder where is your guy and why hasn't he shown up? Yeah, and if you want to go ahead and type into the chat box, share with us. What is your process? Do you just go with the feeling? Are you looking for a particular spark? Are you waiting for your family's approval, your friend's approval? What, what criteria have you been using? So if you want to share with us, anybody want to go ahead and type into the chat box and let us know what's the criteria. We're curious what criteria you have been using. And we're also curious if you want to take it one step further, if you could notice a particular pattern for you and how does that pattern show up? So that's what we want you to start paying attention to. And so we get, we're somebody's... asking you to be a little vulnerable and, and, you know, we appreciate that. We'll, you know, we're not going to share every, all the details about you and who you are. So feel free to just share with us. Yeah. You know, you're anonymous. I mean, nobody strategy. can see you, right? All right. So somebody writes no criteria. I don't even have any chances to make a choice. Yeah. So I would ask that person when you say you don't have any chances to make a choice, that there's something going on that's keeping you from even show, you know, being available to the possibility of having somebody, right? So if you look through your past relationships, are you somebody that's waiting for somebody to choose you? And when somebody does choose you, you just sort of go along with it because you think that's the only shot you've got or something like that, yeah. right? You know, one of the things we hear from pretty much women we talk to all around the world, and it doesn't matter if they live in a thriving metropolis like New York, LA, or London, or if they live in a small town in, in Georgia, or, you know, somewhere up in the Yukon in Canada, that wherever people are, we hear them all say some version of the same thing. Well, maybe the problem is where I am. Yeah, we hear that a lot. <laughs> we hear that the problem is either the location, right? Whether it's a rural location or a bustling metropolis, it doesn't matter. That's the problem. And another thing that we hear is that there seems to be some kind of limiting belief around an age limit. Like if you don't have love by a certain age, then you're sort of doomed to fail or something. And we just want you to know that we have a lot of compassion for you out there. If you think those are the limitations for you, um, we didn't get together until after 40. And we're going to share a little bit more about us and our journey to love and to one another. Um, but we want you to know that this is something where, the problem is not at all where you live or how old you are, and it has nothing to do with your past experiences, although your past experiences are coloring what you believe is possible for you, but your future doesn't have to be a reflection of your past. Right. So let's see what other people are using for criteria here. We have, I predominantly go with my gut, that instant attraction, and then I spend a lot of energy rationalizing. So starts with heart, right? Then I spend a lot of energy rationalizing. That's up to the head. Why I should stay in a relationship where the person is not available. I tend to date emotionally unavailable guys. So the person who wrote this, the woman who wrote this, I just want you to know, I love that you are clear on what the pattern is, right? Because that's really the key is having the awareness of the pattern. We can't change anything unless you have the awareness of what needs changing. So here we have somebody who's clearly stating they start off with the heart spark, right? There's that spark of attraction. And then they rationalize in their head, trying to stay, trying to make it work. And there's that struggle of head versus heart. That's what we're going to spend most of our time talking today about how to um, reconcile that struggle between head and heart. Exactly. So we have somebody else who writes uh, a list of criteria but the absence of chemistry is the main deal breakers. Oh, great. So that's somebody who's using their head to have an idea about who they want, but also checking in with their heart to see is there attraction, is there chemistry, is there a connection? Yeah, and what we want to say about that is the spark of attraction is a non-negotiable. Like that needs to be there. And what we want you to know is that's the promise of what can be if both people choose each other. So the spark is like a promise right? It's not, 
It's not the, it's not the deal. It's not like the whole enchilada yet. It's just like, Ooh, I see it on the menu, right? It's available. It's this thing that can be if certain things occur and what has to happen is that both people choose each other. Yeah. And I'm just going to jump in because my wonderful wife is getting ahead of herself and getting into some of our later content. So let's (laughs) share more about what other people are writing. So we have somebody who says, I think I found the guy. I was so thrilled in the beginning, but now he says he is so in love and I can't object to anything about him. Yet I'm kind of losing interest, even though the chemistry is good help. Yeah. So Notice that, right? Notice that pattern and notice, you know, what's the story there? What's the emotional story there? And and we'll get more into what could be causing that today. Yep. We have somebody who says, my heart, meaning emotions, makes silly choices based on chemistry or neediness. And so I just want to say to that person, notice the judgment of your own emotions, right? Um, just notice that, just notice that there's a judgment about how you feel because there's the judgment piece is something that we want you to look at. And is that a pattern? So just start questioning, just start being open to curiosity about your responses, your behavior, your strategies around creating love. Okay. We have another person who says similar values, goals, and chemistry. So that's somebody who's looking at the bigger picture of head and heart together. And then finally, we have fun, feeling emotionally safe, physically safe, and appreciated. So awesome. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. And, and before we get deeper into yeah, this. And there's more there. I mean, we're, you know, we'll, we'll keep going back to the chat box. So if yes. you want to type anything in there, if you have a question along the way, please feel free to do that. But we want to jump back in over here to looking at how do we resolve this? What's this, this question, right? This issue of my head is saying one thing and my heart is saying something else. And oftentimes they're opposing concepts, right? Head says, oh, I don't know about this person. And the heart says, I do, I do. I want this person, right? Or the other way around on paper, right? The head goes, you know, on paper, this person, I should have this spark, right? I should, right? We're going to put that, we're going to highlight that. When the head is saying, huh, heart, why aren't you going along with me, right? On paper, this person should be my match and you're not playing along here. Like, what's the problem? Exactly. So before we get into all the deeper content, let's talk a little bit about our journeys, about our, you know, struggles through head versus heart and how we got to where we are today. So let me bring up the slides again. So, um, you know, my biggest block to love might seem, um, well, I, I was going to say might seem silly, but that's a judgment. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're judging me. Maybe you're not. <laughs> maybe you think I have it easy because I'm sitting here with this amazing man. I have the pleasure of spending every single day with and doing this amazing work in the world with. But I got to tell you, for most of my adult life, I, um, I felt unlovable. Um, I think that's true even from before I was an adult, actually. But I really struggled in the dating and love arena. Um, I really, um, looking back now, I'm, I know that I put my lovability on the line because I put it in the hands of somebody else, right? I would go on a date with a guy I had that spark of attraction with, and I would hope that he would validate my lovability and sort of give me that nod of, yeah, you're lovable. But that rarely happened. Usually when I had the spark of attraction with somebody, it was somebody who was either emotionally unavailable or literally unavailable as in, in a relationship with somebody else. And when I think back, it started really early on, um, even, I mean, when I was quite young, I'm talking, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. And there's one particular instance, I think as I look back now with 2020 hindsight, there was this experience I had where I was working at a place where there were people um, from close to my age and then much older than me, like 9, 10, 11, 15, 20 years older than me. And in that jumble of people, there was a guy I had the spark of attraction with and he wanted to take me out. But what he told me was he was dating somebody else that we worked with and that they had an agreement that they wouldn't date other people from work. And so would I keep it on the down low, but he wanted to go out with me. Well, what I come to find out later was, no, he was in a relationship with somebody that we all worked with. 
and he, you know, sort of wanted his cake and eating it too or whatever. He wasn't available. He wanted to play around and he wanted my agreement that I would keep it on the down low. And as I look back at that experience, you know, there was all this charge on this person that supposedly wanted me and yet wasn't available to really choose me or really available in the way that would create a satisfaction for my heart and my soul. And that really, you know, moving forward, that happened over and over and over and over again. And this validated this limiting belief that I wasn't really lovable, that I was sort of the second fiddle kind of thing. I, you know, I was definitely the other woman a lot, I'm sorry to say. Um, and that's because my own self-esteem and my own lovability was in the toilet. And it wasn't until I got older that I really started to figure out, oh, wait a second, if I really want somebody to choose me and love me, that my lovability was actually up to me that I had to really love myself. And I'm just gonna say really quick, some of you might know my story and some of you might not, but basically I had this really traumatic event in my 20s. I was in a relationship with a guy and I really thought he was the guy. Anybody, anybody else been there? <laughs> Raise your hand <laughs> if you can relate. Um, and in this relationship, he, um, he was available. We were in relationship. And about 16 months into that relationship, he beat me and it was truly the wake up call of a lifetime. And, um, you know, I, I know that there are women who have suffered worse. I know there's a lot of women who have suffered less and, um, and it doesn't matter whether you've suffered more or suffered less. We've all suffered when it comes to love. And if you've ever had somebody violate you in such a horrible betrayal as to physically beat you, um, I know that that night was um, terrifying. And when I think back at that night, I can, I remember everything. Like it's like time slowed down and I can remember every single event, I, everything moment by moment to that night. And the physical wounds from that night healed rather quickly. But what really plagued me was this concept of how did I choose him? How, how did I choose somebody who would hurt me and physically hurt me that way when the last thing I wanted was to be with somebody who would hurt me in that way? And we all put our heart on the line when we choose somebody and we say that we love them and we move forward towards wanting to be in a relationship with them. And I think about the, my selection, right? What was happening for me to choose this person that would lead me to that event? because I can't change his behavior. I can only look at my own choices and my own strategies around love. And what I kind of found out is that love and pain for me were intertwined. They were like two parts of the same thing. Love came with pain because that was what I knew from my family of origin. I grew up in a home with a lot of abuse, emotional and physical abuse. And so it's what my heart knew what was familiar. It's what my subconscious mind knew was familiar. And so from that day on, I really was looking to how do I shift my criteria to pick somebody who would never harm me? And it was a journey to get there to end up with this guy who I know would never, ever, ever harm me. I mean, he doesn't harm anything. You know, I mean, this Matthew is somebody who escorts the bugs out of our house. You know, he doesn't even want to kill a bug. So um, that's, that's my journey from feeling unlovable to knowing my value and knowing that I am in fact lovable. Hmm. I'm so glad she made the journey. <laughs> so let's talk about my journey. Let's bring this slide back up. Um, so my story has always been, I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to screw it up. And it comes from being the youngest of five and being having three older brothers and trying to physically compete with them right? And because I was smaller, less developed, I couldn't. And so I was always stumbling and falling and not keeping up. And all. it seemed like I was always the reason why something bad happened. And so I have that subconscious belief system, that story that says, I'm going to screw it up. And so when I was in relationship, you want to go there? If you are looking to... Yeah, I'm looking to get off the slide and on the, the, the red stop share button. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. You're going to tell me how to do it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're so cute. Um, <laughs> okay. And so, I want you to see Matthew and not the slide. Hi. 
And so, you know, when I got into relationships, that you know, one or two things would happen. Either I would end up in a relationship with a woman who was much more into me than I was into her, much more crazy about me than I was into her. And, and I always knew in that case that I had, in a sense, the upper hand, right? Because I could get out. I could leave any time. Nobody was going to hurt me because I was in charge. And then there were those other relationships where it's like, I really felt that intense attraction. It was a real strong connection. And in those situations, inevitably, I would do something to sabotage that relationship. I would, in a sense, screw it up. And, you know, it pained me for a long time throughout most of my 20s because there was that one relationship in college. I thought she was the one. I thought this was it. And I totally blew the whole thing up. And I spent years sort of recriminating, uh, feeling this sense of recrimination of, to myself, like really beating myself up. It's like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? You know, and, and so after that, I really began to just play it safe. And I began to find myself mostly in relationships where the women were much more interested in me than I was in them. And it wasn't until I really started doing the healing work, where I really started doing the spiritual work, the deeper work of looking at those wounds and really beginning to shift them and change them that I really began to feel like I was actually capable of creating and sustaining a, a, a lasting relationship. Because to be honest, in my 30s, I didn't really think I was even capable. So why bother? Why even, you know, why even look for somebody? Why not just date around and, and have some fun? And um, so when I decided I was ready, I really got clear on what I was looking for. But I was also clear that this feeling needed to be there as well. And about 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago, you know, spring of 2007, I met this woman and on paper, right, because we're talking about the criteria we have, right, on paper, she looked like, like the perfect person. She was a yoga teacher. She was a meditator. She was a vegan. She rode a bike everywhere. She had this organic garden in her backyard. I mean, there were so many things about her that were part of the lifestyle that I was living in, a lifestyle I was looking to uh, expand. And um, so we ended up dating and went through this crazy dance of, you know, wow, you're a really great guy. You're really cute. I really like you. But, and then she talked about things that were wrong and that she didn't like, I needed to change. And because I was on this sort of, you know, path of growth and, and really looking at how can I be the best person I can be, I would take that feedback and say, hmm, okay, there might be some truth there. I could probably change that. And I would go and work on it with my coaches and my mentors and, and come back. And she'd be like, wow, you, you did some work on that. That's really great. Thank you. Like, yeah. But there was always something. There was always another thing. There was never, it was never going to end. And I realized after a couple of months that this was, this was never going to end. It was always going to be this way. And that's when I started looking at, okay, so why am I here? Why am I in this experience? What am I needing to learn that has brought this person into my life? And what I discovered was it was a deeper sense of self-acceptance. Because if I was still rejecting myself, of course I would be attracted to somebody who was, in a sense, seeing things wrong with me. So it's when I really got that deeper nugget of learning and got that last little piece that literally like a couple of weeks later when I was done with that relationship, Orna showed up. And we all know what happened since then. Right? We all know where we are now. So it really is, you know, about getting clear on those old stories and how they are part of what is driving your heart. And we're going to get deeper in that today to look at what are those stories that are driving those choices from your heart that cause you to not always trust your heart and not always feel like your heart has your best interests in terms of healthy relationships. And we're going to look at why that is, right? Why is this disparity between our head and our heart? And, and so, you know, when I hear Matthew tell his story, like it always makes me sad that there was this woman who was not accepting of who he is, right? I, we always say it like this, that it's important that when you, make the selection that you take the person as is you don't require them to change it's like you know that piece of furniture you find it the as is section in ikea and maybe it's not perfect right it's got some scrapes or bumps or whatever and, and you're like no i love this thing i'm gonna take it home anyway and that's really what we talk about you know when you're ready to make that choice you're going to accept the person as is meaning i don't need this person to change anything for me to want to be with them yeah. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some things that make you a little cuckoo, right? Because we know that 
anytime you're going to spend time with somebody, I mean, Matthew and I spend a lot of time together, we're together pretty much 365, 24 seven. And I would be lying if I said, you know, that there isn't anything I would ever want to change about him, but I don't require him to change. You know, it's not a requirement. And instead, what we do in the dating process is we tend to give the benefit of the doubt in the dating process. And then once we're in the relationship, then we stop giving the benefit of the doubt and those little behaviors and things that sort of, you know, we're overlooking in the dating process suddenly start to really weigh on us. And we start questioning our choice. We start questioning, uh Oh, can I really put up with this? And it's kind of backwards. So we're going to get into more of why that's backwards and what you can do instead yeah. in a little bit. Okay, so let's bring up the slides again. And let's talk about where does the spark of attraction come from? Yeah, where does that spark come from? Like, we know we're talking about the separation. Your head is saying one thing, your heart is saying another, and they don't seem to be in alignment. So if we call that spark something that comes from our heart space, how, how does that work? In other words, what is making your heart have a spark with one, one person instead of another? So we can look at like scientifically, and there's been a lot of science about pheromones and, and you know, how our, how our deeper sort of subconscious, uh, almost animal brain recognizes quote unquote a good match, right? Genetically that it's a smell, it's a chemical reaction and all that. We're not going to get into that because that's not really our expertise. And, <laughs> and I don't think it's really relevant here because there's nothing we can do about that. And it's, instead, what we're going to look at is what we call a sense of recognition, right? The subconscious mind has this sense of recognition, whether it's an energy, whether it's a dynamic, what, whatever the piece is, is that sense of recognition is what our... Um, subconscious mind is is highlighting and when we see that other person there's like this this aura around them this light around them this this spark this charge and and that is the subconscious saying this is familiar now it doesn't say this is familiar good or this is familiar bad we're the ones that fill in the blanks right and decide familiar good and familiar bad and some of us when our when our pickers are off it's because we're saying familiar good when the truth is what it really is is familiar bad you know, so it's about recognizing that that spark, that energy that we feel with another person after we get to meet them, not just from physical appearance, but after we spend some time with them, we go, wow, this person, oh, there's this energy, there's this, mm, I just can't wait, right? I want to get my <laughs> hands on them, right? That that is the subconscious saying, familiar, 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 familiar. And so we want to look at that story of, you know, familiar and how it's either working for you or how it's working against you. And I want to say this because we've used the term story a lot and we're not saying story to diminish what you've been through or plot points or your experiences. We know a lot of you have been through difficult experiences and challenges and that's why you're here because you don't want those tough experiences anymore. You want, you want to create that sort of soul satisfying, long lasting love. And what we want to say is we don't use the word story to diminish anything. We're saying story because it's your story. In other words, it's your belief systems around what your past experiences have been. So there's this saying, and we think it's, it's we want to highlight it. And you may have heard this idea before. We want to highlight this concept that nothing has meaning except the meaning that you give it. So in other words, your past experiences are your past experiences. We can't change what happened to you in the past. Those events occurred. But what we can shift are the meanings that we give those experiences. Because whenever we have an experience, we create a meaning of what that means about us, about what's possible for us, about what's available out in the world. And that meaning can be shifted. It can be tweaked. It can be changed. And that's really what we want to share with you today is your past experiences, those are what they are. But the meaning that you've assigned to those, that's what we're talking about when we say your story, right? Your story is rolled up, not just through the plot points of your past experiences, but through the meanings that you've assigned about what's possible for you and what's available out in the world. And this is where a lot of our belief system comes from. 
And so let's talk about how beliefs are formed. Well, actually, we're you're jumping ahead I am? a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so okay, thanks at, for keeping me on track. We're gonna look at you got it. We're gonna look at what some of the common patterns oh, that right. we see are, right? So there's a lot of common patterns we see in the people we work with about you know how their head or their heart is steering them, maybe not in the direction they really want to go. So the first pattern we recognize, and we've been talking about this one a lot today, is that you either have you have this either or sort of pattern. On the one hand, you either have the spark of attraction with men who are unavailable or who don't commit, or you try to make it work with the guy who on paper looks like a good match, but you don't feel any spark for him. Right. Another common pattern is that you're struggling to decide whether or not a particular guy is right for you. And you're constantly vacillating between staying or going, right? This should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? Right. Right. Maybe your pattern is that you have this extensive list of requirements. I used to joke, you know, some, some ladies show up with like a, you know, if it was a scroll, it would wrap around the earth, right? This long list of requirements and qualities. And when you have a list that's just extensive, there's one of two things going on, right? It's like you're trying to clog up and make sure there isn't a loophole, right? That you somehow, some guy squeaks in that's not what you want. Or there's this other thing that happens where no man can actually live up to the unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Um, sometimes, and we see this pattern a lot, you choose the first available man who shows up, who shows interest, just so you don't have to keep dating because you just, you don't like dating. You don't like being signaled. Hey, here's the guy. He likes me. Let's see what happens. Right. It's that, you know, he chose me kind of thing, right? It's like, oh, here's this guy who showed up. Um, ironically, that, that was the guy I dated before the boyfriend who actually beat me up. The guy I dated before him, we met at an event and he was like, I mean, he was in from the minute we met. I remember, I mean, he sent me roses after 24 hours and literally the card said the first 24 hours. You know, I'd never had somebody pursue me so heartily and it was intoxicating. It was a little intoxicating to have somebody be so sure that I was the one for him. And so for a while I was like, oh, well, it must be true because he sees it that way. And yet he really wasn't the guy for me. He was a nice guy, but not my guy. Um, so, or, or maybe uh, ultimately you feel like your picker's broken yeah. and you can't choose. You just don't even know how to choose because you've chosen badly for so long and you just want someone else to decide for you. Please just pick someone for me and then I don't have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm going to say guilty as charged on this one. I used to feel like my picker was so broken. I actually wanted my girlfriends to like find me and, you know, create an arranged marriage, but not, you know, parents to parents, just friends to friends. Like, you guys pick. I'm not good at this. I don't know how to do this. I clearly make the worst choices for myself. So here, girlfriends, you all know me. Pick somebody for me and, and I'll, you know, I'll go down that road. <laughs> so if you're there, you know, we just want you to look at what's your pattern. And maybe you're checking off a few of these. Maybe you're not just one of these, right? I mean, I know for myself when I was single and I was struggling, certainly in the dating, you know, in relationship arena, that I could check off more than one of these boxes. And that's what we want you to take a look at. What is your pattern? Okay. So what is really required for soul satisfying, long lasting love? Well, let's, let's break it down, right? Let's look at what are the pieces that ultimately need to be there so that you can like this lovely old couple here in the, in the slide, right? So you can live happily ever after walking off into the autumn of your life. That was nice. I like that. All right, so attraction, right? Attraction tends to be a, a huge problem because, you know, people are worried. Maybe, you know, you find yourself attracted to the wrong man, attracted to the unavailable guy, attracted to the alcoholics, attracted to whatever, you know, what you know is always wrong for you. And so you can't trust attraction. And so there's a desire to maybe throw attraction out and just say, okay, so maybe it's, once again, the guys who are crazy about me because... I know when I'm crazy about them, it goes badly. And the thing about attraction, and again, I was jumping ahead, so I'm going to repeat what I said a little bit earlier and go more in depth, that this idea of attraction is something, when Matthew and I are working with the client, we consider attraction like a, a tick box, right? It's like, oh, attraction, check. That thing, it needs to be there. That spark of attraction absolutely positively needs to be there. 
I mean, Matthew and I this fall, we'll have 10 years together as a couple. And I'll be honest, when, you know, when we're at a party and you know, we're not in the same room for a while and he walks in the room, my, my heart lights up. I still have that spark of attraction with him. Or, you know, the other day we're at the gym and I'm on my, you know, the, the treadmill or whatever, and I catch his reflection in the screen, right, as he's walking by or doing his thing at the gym. And I'm like, ooh, you know, I, I, yeah, I still who's feel that, that way. Who's that cute guy? Yeah, who's that, <laughs> who's that cutie? Oh, that's mine. That's my husband, right? And that's what we want you to get is you can't fake it, right? You can't, there's no fake it till you make it when it comes to the spark of attraction. Yeah. There's no faking it. So I think that's really important, but I'm going to say it again. You can't fake attraction. I know back when I was online dating and I was single, there was this guy who on paper, he should have been perfect for me. And I kept, he kept asking me out. So I kept saying yes, because my friends kept saying, you have to give those nice guys a chance. And I, I went out with them and I went out with them and I went out, I don't know, probably 10, 12, 14 dates. I don't remember when he finally stopped asking me out, but oh my gosh, I just, I didn't have that spark. And I kept waiting, hoping and waiting and hoping that I would feel that spark of attraction. And, and it's funny because I think of myself as a pretty warm person overall, but I think he thought I was kind of cold because, you know, he'd go to kiss me and I, oh, I wasn't so sure I even wanted to kiss him, right? I mean, I just really didn't have that spark of attraction. You cannot fake it. You know, when I was much younger and I was studying acting, I remember I had an acting teacher who was talking about what it takes to be successful in, in, the, in that field. And um, he had this list of 10 things. And he would say, talent is only one of 10. It's only one of 10 things. I mean, you should have some talent. You're not going to get very far without any talent. But you could have all the talent in the world. And if you don't have these nine other things, then you're not going to get anywhere. You're just not going to have much of a career. And I see that a lot with so many people that, you know, I knew when I was younger as, act, as an actor who were incredibly talented. We kept wondering, how come they can't make it? It's because there were 10 other things, on nine other things on the list that they weren't necessarily putting energy and effort towards. So it's the same thing in relationship. If there's 10 things you need to make a long-lasting, soul-satisfying soul relationship, well, attraction's one of 10, but it's not the only one. And it also can't be ignored. Like Gorda said, you can't take it off the list. So oftentimes what happens is we put too much energy, too much importance, too much whatever on this, clout. too much clout on this <laughs> feeling, this feeling that we have about this person. And the thing about feelings is this feelings change. That is the nature of feelings. Feelings are transitory. They don't last. They, they change, you know, they, they get more intense, they get less intense, other emotions take over, everything shifts and changes with feelings. And so, yes, does that feeling have to be there? Because down the road, when you've been together 10 years and you've been through a lot, and we've been very honest about this, we, we're very passionate people and sometimes that passion is not in agreement. And so we have these things called arguments, right? You know, there is no such thing as a perfect soulmate relationship where everything is hunky-dory 24-7. But we know that that, passion that we initially felt for each other is still there. And so when we have those bumps in the road, when we have those disagreements, when we come across times where it's like we're a little frustrated with each other, well, that passion is still there. And the, and the memory of that time when we were together early on, the, the romance period of the relationship is still there. And so we know that that is possible to come back again because it has. We've bumped up, we've bumped heads, we've had rough periods, and then we've come back together and the passion's still there, right? And so that's what we want you to understand about chemistry and attraction. It's, it's a tick box. It's one of 10, but it can't be everything. Yeah. And at the same token, you can't throw it out the window, right? You can't say, oh, okay, I don't trust my heart, so I'll just go along with my head and try to fake it till you make it with somebody who's crazy about you. We, we've talked to a lot of women that are stuck in that kind of situation. And what ends up happening is that it feels like you're settling and you can't settle for a lifetime with somebody. You just can't because there will be challenges. And that, that spark of attraction is that thing that you have to have. I'm going to say it again. It's the promise. It's the promise of what can be if both people continue to choose each other. 
And that's the thing that's the most important is the attraction is there as this spark to say, oh, let me, let me research this more, right? Like this is a possibility with this person. But in order to move deeper, then both people have to choose each other. If it's, if it's only one, a one-sided thing and you've chosen them and he didn't choose you or he chose you and you didn't choose him, it's lopsided. It's not going to work. It's not going to play out over time because we want to talk about what's creating that longevity, that soul satisfying, long lasting where you're like, oh, okay, we might be going through a challenging time, but I'm sticking through it with you no matter what. And that's what we all want, right? We want that person who's going to choose us come what may, right? From that movie uh, Moulin Rouge with Nicole Kidman and Ewan McGregor, right? Come what may. And that's what we want. And so in order to have that kind of relationship, you can't throw that spark of attraction. You can't throw attraction out the window. It has to be there. It's an ingredient in the recipe. Okay. So let's look at one of the other important ingredient, ingredients is compatibility. And so when we talk about compatibility in relationship, this sometimes feels at odds with the attraction. So instead of looking at that overlap and how they connect, let's just look at compatibility as its own entity, right? And so a lot of times when we're looking at compatibility, what happens is we look at hobbies and music, this idea of do we like to do the same kinds of things? Right. Do we both like golf? Do we both like bowling? Do we both like salsa dancing? Whatever the thing is. Right. Do we both like wine? Do we both like jazz? Do we both, you know, like the same kinds of music, movies? Uh, <laughs> I almost said music and movies all together is one <laughs> word. That's, that's not a word, Orna. Music, movies, right? These things. And so when we're talking about compatibility, compatibility isn't about our hobbies. You know, when, sometimes these, the online dating sites and apps match us up with like this idea and these concepts around compatibility. And I'm sure any of you have done any online dating, you've had this experience where, again, on paper, there should be that spark of attraction, right? You're matched up with somebody where there's this, all this compatibility. You like to do the same kinds of things and you go out and you go out to meet that person. No spark, right? It's happened. I know it's happened for you. And the reason is, is because compatibility when there's too much weight on compatibility, that ends up being a platonic friendship. There's not enough differences to create the spark of attraction. And so compatibility is this double-edged sword where, yes, you want to be compatible with your beloved, but it's not based on do you like the same kinds of things or to do the same kinds of things. It's much deeper than that. Exactly. So we know a couple. Um, and they've been together for a long time and they're very happy together and yet they have very different interests, right? He likes uh, outdoors, he likes sort of adventure things, he, he's got this crazy um, powered parachute that he flies, right? I mean, he's somebody who likes to be out doing these adventures and she's somebody who works for herself and literally spends all her time in front of her computer and, you know, lets him and go and do his thing. And, and so they, they come together in a way that's really beautiful because they're compatible on some deeper levels. They're compatible personality wise. They're compatible in terms of their, their values. And now I'm getting ahead a little bit, right? But they're not necessarily doing the same things together all the time. And that doesn't have to be. I mean, you could have one partner who loves to rough it and go camping and sleep on the ground. And the other one's like, you can't find me anywhere but a five-star hotel. Now, you would think that that can't work, but it really can because those are superficial things. Those are things we can work around. Those are things we can have, you know, we can have different trips. You know, we have a friend, and I think this is hilarious, you know, <laughs> when we asked him what is his key to the longevity in his marriage, right? And actually, Orna asked this when we were first engaged, because it's sort of a practice she had for years. She would ask couples, well, what's, what's the secret, right? What's the secret that makes your relationship last? And, and so she was looking for advice. And this one friend of ours said, separate vacations. That was the answer. And that was the answer. Separate and vacations. And this is somebody who's been married for decades and decades and decades, right? Children together, right? Separate vacations. And so that, you know, when we talk about the concept of a true soul partnership, there isn't a one size fits all. Your true soul partnership is going to be unique to you and your partner, right? Our true soul partnership is unique to us. 
I mean, it's not meant for every couple to work together and live together the way we do. I mean, some couples, it's just, it's not in the dynamic to really spend that much time together. And I don't care what, you know, sort of lens you look at, at Matthew or myself at when you look at us together as a, as a couple, you know, whether it's Vedic astrology or Western astrology or feng shui or hand analysis or whatever, you know, tarot cards or, you know, whatever it is that you were looking at, any practitioner we've ever had any kind of reading with looks at us through whatever lens, that, whatever tool that they're using at the time. And they go, oh, oh, now I get it. Now I understand how you two can work together and be married with each other. I mean, it's, it's not meant for everybody. And so crafting your own true soul partnership is important as a single person out of a relationship to know what it is that you're looking for, because that's part of the evaluation process in your criteria when you're trying to decide if somebody is a match for you. So the compatibility piece, again, it's not based on these superficial ideas of, do you like to do the same kinds of things? It's much deeper than that. And it has to do with this idea of value. So we're going to go much deeper. So stay tuned. We're going to go much deeper into the idea of shared values in this webinar. So stay tuned for that. All right. Well, actually, we're going to do that. Is it next? It is next. Oh, look at that. Right? So looking at shared <laughs> values. Because shared values, for us, it's the key to longevity. It's the key to making a, a relationship last. You know, oftentimes... You know, couples are really happy when it's just the two of them together and suddenly they have children and then they're fighting all the time because they don't have shared values about how they want to raise children. Or maybe everything's great. They have great chemistry. They, they have great compatibility. They get along. They do a lot of things together, but they have very different ideas about money and how to manage money. And they're fighting about money all the time because they don't have shared values around money and where money comes from and how they make money and how they manage money and do all of that. So when we're talking about shared values, we're talking about the deeper things that are really important to you in your relationship in terms of the dynamic between the two of you. When, you know, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, didn't no, mean to jump okay, in. Great. So what I want to say about that is, you know, when we're talking about values and what somebody values, a lot of times, especially when we're really intellectual and we like to analyze, we try to have a conversation with somebody we're getting to know at an attempt to discover somebody's values. And the thing is, you cannot discover somebody's values by talking with them and asking them about their shared values, right? Or what they value. In other words, um, let's take honesty, for example. I could imagine, right, that, that most of you that are listening could say, oh, I really value honesty, particularly in intimate relationship. I want my partner to be honest with me. And yet, if you're getting to know somebody in the dating process, you can't say to somebody, well, do you value honesty? Because there's not a person in the world that's going to say, oh, no, I just lied to you like 10 times in the last hour, right? Nobody is going to suddenly admit that they don't value honesty or they don't value family or they don't write. When we're talking about these concepts of what makes up a person, we discover what somebody values as we share and spend time with them. We share time, we spend time, and we get to know somebody because what somebody values is where they spend their resources, their time, their energy, their money right? These are the things that we value. If somebody says that they value family and yet they don't spend time with their family at all, they don't make an effort at all with their family, they don't make an effort to get to know your family if you would like for them to, right? Mm -hmm. Then they clearly have a, there's some kind of concept that's missing that doesn't translate from having an intellectual conversation to how their behavior shows up. And so when we're talking about shared values, it's something that's a discovery process, right? You can't go through, you know, on an online dating profile and go, well, I'm looking for somebody who values this, 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 and this, and expect that you're going to really get that person. Because people have a skewed idea about what they think they value versus how is it in practice? How is it in their real life? How does their behavior show up? I mean, one of the reasons that Matthew and I can work together and, and be married to each other and spend an exorbitant amount of time together is because we do very much value the same things. And I will also say it's not a 100% match. It's a majority match. And that's what you're looking for in the shared value arena 
it's not an exact match for match as far as 100%, right? We're looking at a majority match. And that's really what you're looking for. You're looking at that 70, 75 and up percentage match of do I have shared values with this person? Because there are places where you're going to differ, where you're going to be different people. Um, I mean, I'm very much, I like to plan. I'm a systems person. I like to have all my I's dotted and T's crossed ahead of time. And that's not the way my husband is. And I don't require him to be a different person because he can't be the kind of person that I am that likes to dot all the I's and cross all the T's ahead of time and get it all done and then review it. It's that he just can't function that way. And so I don't have this unrealistic expectation that, well, now we got married and so we're going to do things my way because I'm really good at doing this thing this way, right? It doesn't work like that. And that ends up coming from an ego place where a lot of couples start to falter once they start dating. And so I, I do want to well, say this well, piece about, okay, sorry. I, I want to give an example. I'm going to give so people I'm gonna let you in more there. Deeply, right? <laughs> so there's a, there's a process we do when we work with our private clients where we really, you know, suss out what the values are and how they work and how to create a really good list and how to, you know, really energize it and, and get your subconscious on board with it and all of that. So we were in the process of doing this with one of our clients and one of her values was partnership. This whole idea that she wanted uh, not just a person who she was in relationship, but she wanted a partner, a partner in life, a partner in the things they're creating together. And she meets this guy in the process of doing this and they start dating and there's a great intellectual connection between the two of them. They have great conversations. There's a good sense of chemistry between the two of them. They definitely both feel attracted to each other. And they, they have these discussions about partnership and they seem to be on the same page. And yet for her, something's missing. And what she realizes as she's working with us is she realizes what she also wants is for a man to step up and take charge sometimes and to like plan a date and all that. And so we work with her about how to really make the request, right? How to go up to the guy and say, you know, I really feel cherished when a guy like plans a date and surprises me and takes me out and, and, and has this sense of romance. And, and she asks it in such a way that the guy she's dating says, great, I'm happy to do that. So their next date, he plans it. He does the whole thing. He takes her out and they have a great time. And at the end of the date, he turns to her and says, you know, I did this because you asked me so nicely and I really wanted to please you and make you happy. But the truth is, this is not who I am. I, I don't want to be doing this. I actually would rather things were decided 50-50. And so his idea of partnership was actually very different from hers because his idea of partnership was, look, everything's 50 50. You're not going to put stuff on me. I'm not going to put stuff on you. We're going to talk about all of it. And for her, that was a bit exhausting and ultimately didn't allow her to feel cherished. And so even though on paper, they shared values, they had a shared value. The truth is in practice, it was a big conflict and it would have been a big conflict. And at the end of that date, the two of them were very clear. This was not a good match. And that's important, right? To have that sense of knowing, to have that sense inside of you, you can say, you know what, I'm attracted to this person, there's a lot of good things here, but this is not a good match because we're probably gonna fight about this thing for the rest of our lives and I don't wanna fight about that. Yeah, and trust me, there's gonna be plenty of things for you to have conflict over in your relationship, <laughs> but the value piece can't be one of them, right? The value thing isn't one of them. And, and really, most people do it, like I was saying earlier, you know, there's this idea that we do things like a little bit backwards, right? We end up, um, you know, we have this feeling, we have this spark of attraction. And so Matthew and I say we twist into a pretzel, right? Trying to make love last, right? We're twisting and shifting and trying to make it work because we have the spark of attraction. And so we don't know if we're ever going to have that spark of attraction again. And so we have to hold on to this person with all our might and do our best to make it work. And there's something really wrong with that because when we look at the stages of relationship, most people are, are, are making the commitment before the commitment stage of relationship. So I'm just going to touch on these very quickly because we, the, you know, I think it's important that you sure. have this concept, right? And this is not ours. There's a lot of different labels for the five stages of relationship. I mean, there's a lot of people who do different work in it. We particularly like the labels of Dr. Susan Campbell. You can look her up. I like to give credit where credit is due. And Susan Campbell um, goes labels the five stages this way. She says the first stage is the romance phase, which we've talked about, right? The second stage of relationship is the power struggle. 
And the power struggle stage of relationship is after the chemicals and the romance phase is worn off. And now we see the person as who they really are. And suddenly we're like, wait a second, what have I done? Right. And, and it's funny because the romance stage shows up because the person is different from you. It's like, it's exciting and you're curious and you want to get to know that person. And it's, ooh, it's juicy and humana, humana and all that good stuff. And then when the, the chemicals wear off from the romance phase, we end up being stuck in a power struggle because we just, we have this thought that's like something along the lines of, you know, we'd get along a lot better if you would just do things my way. And that's the power struggle. My way is the right way. Your way then must be wrong. And so the power struggle for a lot of people, they just lather, rinse, repeat, either with the same person, romance, power struggle, romance, power struggle, or much more common in today's world is they go romance, power struggle, break up, new person. Romance, power struggle, break up, new person. And there's this lather, rinse, repeat. Or they do it with the same person. Romance, power struggle, break up, get back together, romance, power struggle, right? It's, it's, that's that sense of doing it with the same person. The third stage of relationship is called the stability stage. And the stability stage of relationship is where the couple, instead of fighting each other, choose each other. And it really becomes this you and me against the world kind of concept. So it, you know, most fights are an ego fight, right? I need to do it my way. I want to have it my way. My way is better than your way. My way of reacting is better than your way of reacting, whatever it is, right? It's an ego struggle. And so when we move out of the power struggle into the stability stage, we stop fighting for our ego needs and we start fighting for the relationship. We say, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to fight for this, right? I'm going to fight for us. And it's that shift in thinking away from I'm fighting for me and what I need and what I want to, I'm going to fight for us. And that's how we get out of the power struggle and into the stability stage. And then we move into stage four, which is the commitment stage. And the commitment stage, and Orna actually talked a little bit about this earlier, is the part that says, I choose you as is, right? I choose you warts and all. I choose you with the ding and the scratch. And, and I'm here in the as is section in Ikea, and I say, I love this anyway. I love you anyway. I choose you anyway, right? It's the commitment stage is when the couple is ready to make a lasting commitment, a lifelong commitment with one another. And what most people do is they make the commitment in the romance phase. And by the time they have like the ceremony, like the wedding, they're already in the power struggle. And it's stage four, that commitment stage is when you're ready to make a commitment because that's when you say, oh, I take you as is. I choose you, warts and all. And, and I just want to say this to all the hopeless romantics out there because there is a part of me that is a little bit of a hopeless romantic. And that part of me would love to think that it had to only be Matthew that I could spend my life with. But there's a grown up part of me. There's this grown up intellectual, really smart part of me as a grown up that knows that if it wasn't Matthew, it would be somebody else. And there's a lot of mistakes around people, this myth of there's only one person out there. If it wasn't Matthew, it would be somebody else. And if it wasn't me for him, it would have been somebody else. And I, maybe that takes some of the romance out of it for you. I don't know. It doesn't do it for me because ultimately Matthew and I choose each other. We choose each other. We choose each other over and over and over and over again. And to me, that's hot and that's sexy. And that's what I want is I want somebody that sees all the parts of me and says, I choose you anyway. And that's what the commitment stage is really about. And then the final stage is called the co-creation stage or the bliss stage. And this is that part where you're together, you're in that commitment, you've chosen each other, and now you can come together and you can create something that's larger than you. And sometimes that means it's a family, sometimes it means you're creating a bigger sense of community around your relationship, sometimes it means you're creating some something philanthropic, right? Or like us, we created this work, we created this work together, and we really brought our, our skill sets together, our desires together about what we wanted to be and who we wanted to be in the world, and we thought, you know, we could do this together. We could do something bigger than that's just us and have a bigger impact than say that just Orna could have or I could have. And so it is that co-creation stage and that bliss stage that we are all looking for, right? That idea that, oh, you know, bliss is what I really want. I want to feel that love. I want to feel that, that sense of like, this is my soulmate. This is my partner. But the truth is you got to get through the first four stages in all relationships, all relationships go through those stages. You don't get out of it. You don't bypass the power struggle because you're more spiritually advanced, right? You don't bypass 
any of this. You go through it because we're human. And the whole goal of this is to go through the fire of relationships so that we can even become better people. I mean, our belief is that relationship, intimate relationship is the most powerful personal growth tool that there is. And so, you know, we use it to really create this amazing thing. And if that's what you're looking for, then that's what we're really talking about today, right? How do we reconcile this heart head um, disparity, right? How do we do that? So we're going to give you some practical tools on, on how to do that. You want to, yeah. And I, I just want to acknowledge we've been talking for a while, so we're going to, we're going to start moving through some more content here because we've got a lot more to share and we've already been on going for about two hours. So no, an hour. Oh, an hour. We started at 10. I got to, that's okay. Keep track of time. We've only been on for an hour. I thought two hours. That seems crazy. No, an hour. Okay. Okay. So how do you get out of overwhelm when it comes to love and dating? Because that's what so many people we talk to are experiencing, right? It's like oh, online dating, blah, right? They, everybody hates yeah. online dating and the apps aren't any better. And so how do we get out of that feeling? Because truth be told, it's the best tool out there. It's like, you know, you want to find a new career and you're not going to get on LinkedIn. That doesn't make any sense, right? You've got to use the tools that are available and there's some really good tools. It's a question of using them well. Yeah, and not only that, but overwhelm shows up in so many different forms, right? So if you have the overwhelm of dating, there's a few things, just practical things that you can do. Number one, slow down. You know, Matthew and I say that hope, hope is the first thing that comes into our relationship and it's the last thing to leave. And that's, that's the really hard part because we, we go on that first meet with all this hope, right? Oh, I hope this is the one. And then I don't have to do this dating thing anymore. Not a good, not really a good um, strategy for finding that soulmate partnership. It's just not. So you want to slow down when you're going on a first meet. That's all it is. You're just meeting somebody <laughs> for yeah. the first time. And I want to say this. Your online dating profile is by design should be getting you dates. It's not about from, it, it shouldn't be written from a place of, I need to narrow it down to this one person. It should be, it's like a, a marketing message to get you dates. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And, and so you want to slow down. But then, you know, we've worked with clients who, as soon as they meet a guy that's like remotely acceptable, He's good enough. He likes her. He's got like three of the qualities she's looking for. She's stopping seeing anybody else and going into commitment with this guy. As if, you know, if I jump into commitment, if I jump into the relationship quickly, then, then I'm going to find my soulmate quicker. And the truth is that actually slows things down because you're wasting time with somebody who may or may not be the right person. You're jumping in too early and you're not allowing yourself to really get to know somebody. So slow things down. The next piece is to practice, right? Practice, practice, practice. That's what dating really is. Dating isn't, you know, finding the one, like we're going to talk about next. Dating is practice. It's a way of getting to know people, showing up more authentically, getting clear on what you want and making requests, speaking how you feel, really showing up and just saying, hey, I'm going to practice today and see how authentic I can be. And it might sound funny to some of you for like, wait, practice being authentic. Like, aren't you automatically authentic? But actually, when it comes to going on dates, most people are not authentic, right? They're, they're like, again, twisting into a pretzel or they're doing something, right? We're all on our best behavior. And there's nothing wrong with being on your best behavior. But, you know, yeah, you, don't share all your horror stories on the first date. Yeah, I mean, we're not saying that. We're just saying that your authenticity comes from identifying how you're feeling and expressing it. And that's what we want you to practice. We want you to practice being you, like unapologetically you. Um, I, I know for myself, this was something that was a difficult journey. Um, I know when I was younger and I was in dating, I definitely was the pretzel twisting gal. I mean, there was this guy I remember in, um, in college and he was really super hot and I wanted him to pick me. And so, you know, I... I, I, I really didn't even pay attention to if I really liked him as a human being. And it's, it's sort of funny to say that, but it's like the way I behaved on our dates was the way I imagined he wanted me to be. 
And then I end up in a relationship with this guy that I realized shortly in, you know, shortly, very quickly, I realized, oh, I actually don't even, I don't really like this person that much. I mean, yeah, he's hot, um, but, you know, we don't have a lot. There's just, you know, the chemistry is all there, but there's not nothing else. Like there's nothing, there's no foundation underneath that chemistry, Look, you know, and I just, I didn't really like who he was. And so when we say practice, we mean get good at practicing meeting people, get good at getting to know somebody. You know, when we um, tell our clients to go, um, you know, off to a, an offline event to meet people, you know, maybe a, a meetup, right? Like a singles meetup or something. And we hear this all the time. Well, there are a bunch of women there, not that many men. And I always think, well, what a great opportunity because it doesn't matter who you meet out in the world. Every new person you meet ha knows other people that you don't know. I'm going to say that again. It sounds so obvious, but every person you meet knows people that you don't know. I mean, I have a friend from college who's married to a fellow because I met his brother online dating. I met his brother online dating. His brother was single. My friend was single. The four of us got together. She's now married to that guy, right? So every single person you meet has the potential to introduce you and connect you with people you haven't met yet. So get, when you're talking about practicing, we're talking about practicing meeting people. And that's what really a first meet is all about. If you're going from online to offline, that first meet, we call it zero. It's not even first date. It's zero. It's first meet. After first meet, if you get asked out again, that's a first date. But if you haven't met the person yet, there isn't a lot, you know, this idea of, you know, weeding people out to the point of where I want to be sure before I go spend my time in person, that's a bad strategy because you need to go on a lot of dates for the dating process to be the process that it's meant to be. So it's a filtering process. It's a weeding out process. I mean, could you imagine hiring somebody and working at HR and the first person comes in and you look at their resume and you're pretty sure just by one resume that, oh, I think this looks pretty good. And you meet that person and they go, oh, yeah, that looks like the person that's on this resume. You're hired, right? That's not the way we hire somebody for a job. And it shouldn't be the way you choose somebody to be in a relationship with either. Exactly. So slow down, practice, practice, practice. And we're going to talk about this stop looking for the one. Yes. So stop looking for the one. We hear this so often. It's like, well, you know, he, he's a, his pictures are good and everything, but, you know, there's something in his profile that I don't think we'd get along, right? He's not the one. You're not going to find the one in a profile. You're not going to find the one in a profile. So stop looking for the one. Instead, start looking for dates. That's all you need. You need a date. You get to meet somebody in person. You get to see what they're like physically. You get to feel energetically what it feels like to be in the same space with them. And you get a much better sense of who they are. Everybody is getting online dating wrong. Every, most people don't like writing their profile. So they grin and bear it and throw some stuff in there and then hit save and never look at it again. So who knows how old that profile is? I remember I met somebody online from a profile that was like three years old on a site that I'd stopped being active on about two years before. And this person found me and like, you know, looked me up and, and, you know, we went on a couple of dates and she's like, wait, you're not on your profile. I'm like, well, that profile is like three years old. I've changed. I'm not that same person anymore. Right. But she was stuck on the profile instead of just dealing with who I am and who's showing up here in the room today. And that's what we want you to do is stop looking for the one online and start looking for dates, start looking for a reason to say yes. So you can get the first meet, you can be in their physical presence, you can find out what they're like, and then you can take it from there. And I'm going to say something that might be revolutionary for some of you, I don't know, but usually I've had a lot of people be like, what? And I'm going to just put it out there. Attraction, right? That first thing that we were talking about. Attraction is not a requirement for a date. Like when we were talking about attraction needs to be there for a relationship. That's what we mean for a relationship. That tick box needs to be there. However, you will discover so much about you if you just go on dates and don't worry about whether there's an attraction there or not, especially from a computer screen or a handheld device, right? Like, we don't know. You have to be yeah. in that person's energy. So stop looking for the one immediately and weeding people out because there might not be the one. That's not where we want you to be. Slow down, practice. 
stop looking for this magical miracle sign that there's going to be the one you might not know for the first few handful of dates. And that's really okay. You might not know. Now it's when you get months and months in or years and years in, and you're still not sure that's where things get a little wonky, right? Cause that's where your criteria is off. You should certainly know, you know, if you're going to get into a commitment with somebody, if you're going to say, look, I'm going to stop dating other people and it's just going to be you and me, then you should have a good sense that this is probably a good match for you to do that with. Um, don't do that just because that's the only option that's showing up. Right? Or because he wants you to commit. Right. That's a big mistake that we see a lot of ladies make, right? It's like he wants the commitment. And so because he wants the commitment, you'll stop dating everybody else. Well, no. If you're not sure, then you're not sure. And you need to stay, we're going to say the dating laboratory, right? Because that's really what you're in. If you're dating, you're in the dating laboratory. And so you're going to put things together and see what happens. You're, there has to be a part of you that's working from the observer perspective, really looking at, well, how am I showing up, right? How am I showing up? And that's what, that's what we mean by slow down. Slow down, observe, pay attention. And if you like to journal, this is a great place to journal and take notes so you can really pay attention to what's really going on with you. Don't take notes about him. Take notes about what's going on with you. Notice what's going on with you. How are you feeling, right? What's going on with you? That's really, that, that will tell you everything. So just as a quick reminder, slow down, practice, 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 and stop looking for the one. So next, how do you know without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt that he is right for you, right? That's the question. That's the question everybody's asking. I even saw a question in the chat box. How do I know? I've been with this guy. How do I know? Well, we're going to tell you how you don't know first, right? Don't decide based on a feeling, right? Don't decide based on a feeling. Feelings change. So if all you have is that attraction and this feeling, right? Oh, I think about him all the time. If it's, that's it, if that's the only thing there, that's only, remember, it's one of your ingredients of the true soul partnership recipe. And you can't bake a cake with only one ingredient. You just can't. Like you're like, well, I got the flour, but I don't have the eggs and I don't have the chocolate. And I don't, right? You wouldn't make the cake. And so that's what we really want you to understand, right? Don't just go based on a feeling. The feeling isn't enough. And I, I know that that might be heartbreaking for some of you. I mean, I had a conversation um, recently with a girlfriend who's ending a relationship, which it's ended. She's, they've decided to end the relationship. And it's a tough, it's a really tough decision for people to make to end the relationship. And there's two things that I told her, you know, one of them is I said, you know, I know it sucks because I know you love him and I know he loves you, but love ultimately is not enough because the feeling itself is not enough, right? It's just not. And, and I, I want to say that again, because I think that's somewhat revolutionary, this idea that love is not enough. You know, we think, well, we love each other. So we should be able to make this work. Well, you can love each other and have this intense feeling and attraction and, and, and love for each other and yet be so incompatible and not have shared values and, and you know, not even be on the same page with what you really want from life. And so that feeling, that love that you feel with that other person isn't going to get you th over those hurdles. It's just, you can't, it's just not enough to, to make it through all the challenges that life will throw your way. There's going to be challenges. So we're like, how do you pick somebody, right? How do we reconcile this head heart thing? And how do you select somebody that no matter what, they're going to choose you, right? Come what may. And so if you're leveraging it all on the feeling, oops, you're going to be in trouble. There's got to be more there. There's got to be foundation that's more because what we do is we go out in the world, we meet somebody, whoosh, we have this spark of attraction with them, right? This whole love by accident myth that when we meet the right person, it's going to magically work out. And I know that hasn't happened for any of you. You wouldn't be with us today, you know, over an hour into this webinar. So if it hasn't happened for you yet that way, please release the fantasy, this idea that just love is enough. And the second thing that I told my friend, and I, I'm going to share this, it's a little bit of a sidetrack, but I think it's important is, I said, you know, now that you've just, because they've made the decision to part, and I told her, I said, well, you might not like it, but I'm going to tell you what I tell my clients, which is now you have to kill the hope. And you know what she said to me? She said, I know that that's true because right now I want to tell you to fuck off. 
And I could appreciate what she was saying and we're good enough friends that she could tell it to me just like that, the way she was feeling. And I, I felt her pain, right? Because when we love somebody, but we know it's still not the right person, that it's not going to work, that's, it's a painful experience, but it's a growth experience. And so what I want to tell you from that place is when your heart breaks, it actually breaks open to hold more love, to hold more love. Who is that love meant for? It's meant for you. When your heart breaks, it breaks open to hold more love. So as you move through these experiences, your heart might break so that you can love yourself more, so that you choose yourself and not somebody who's less than what you're looking for to move through life together. You know, Matthew and I face our challenges together and to continue to choose each other because we had a really solid love for self before coming together. If you're looking for your partner to complete you from the Hollywood myth, like that Jerry Maguire movie, it's romantic. However, in practice, it's codependent. Nobody completes you. If you're looking for somebody to complete you, go back to the start of this webinar and watch it again, because you're not gonna get that soul-satisfying, long-lasting love if you're looking for somebody to complete you that is a codependent relationship and it will have that codependence that's not a healthy expression of what love can be to move through those five stages of relationship and create that lasting connection that you want with somebody. So one of the other feelings that people use to either stay in a, to, usually to stay in a relationship too long is this feeling of scarcity, this feeling of, well, am I going to find anything better? I mean, this is good. He's good to me. He really loves me. And so maybe, right. And that's a feeling of scarcity. That's a feeling that says, I'm not going to get any better than this. And, and I've been there. Look, I was in that relationship where I said, look, I it may not get any better than this. This is not great, but it's what I found. And we, we have a good attraction with each other. We don't always get along, but you know, there's the sex was good. And so, you know, maybe we can make this work. And it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's no fun. It's not actually, it's not nice to the other person to do that. It's actually out of your integrity to do that to the other person. So scarcity is a feeling also that, you know, you can't create long lasting soul satisfying love with. Okay. There's a, so there's a couple more here. Let's go back to the slide. Um, ultimately his behavior tells you what's important to him. We had a client, and Orna brought this up earlier, right? Family. We had a client who said he really valued family, that family was actually, she said family was really important to her. And she was dating a guy who said family was important to him as well. What was really interesting though about him and family was he would go to his family events, but never invite her. And he was never really interested in coming to her family events. So even though he said family was really important to him, his actions actually told you the complete opposite. And it turned out that there was a reason why he wasn't bringing her to his family events because there was somebody else going. And, you know, so his, yep. his behavior tells you what's important to him. And if his behavior is telling you that you're not important to him, believe it. Don't try to justify it. Don't try to argue it. Don't try to, because there's a feeling, you know, there's that intensity. He's got to be my soulmate. And yet his behavior tells me the opposite because he doesn't treat me like a soulmate would, right? Believe his behavior. Yeah. If somebody for whatever reason is not available right now and they're asking you to hold on, right? Um, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on for, right? Because you have a feeling about this person. You know, people tell you who they are by their actions. And so what we do is we overlook their actions because of our feelings, right? And so we, what we're saying is look at the person at who they are, look at their behavior and decide, is this, some, is this what I want? And if it's not in alignment with what you want, move on, move on, cut your losses, move on. We see so many people and that's the place where we get into this idea of like, oh my gosh, I'm scared to waste my time. And the thing is, is, the biggest um, issue that we see that quote unquote waste time, and we ultimately don't think anything is a waste of time because there's always something to learn and gain and, and grow from. 
But if you want to speed up the process from where you are to being with your beloved, then notice somebody's behavior and decide if you're okay with it. If you're not okay with it, move on to the next, to the next, to the next. You can't constantly require somebody to be changing their behavior for them to be the person for you because you have this feeling. This feeling is great. Your behavior is not. So if you just change your behavior, then we can work. That would be great. See, that doesn't work either. That's because then you're, once again, you're not in that space where I take you as is. So you can't require somebody to be a different person just because you have a good feeling about them. Yep. All right. So, and so back. we're back to the slide. And then, yep. Oh, I'm learning how to fly the plane. That's exciting. Okay, so we're going to say this, right? How do you know without a shadow of a doubt that he's right for you? Well, you have to make a choice, right? Ultimately, love is a choice. Long-lasting love is certainly a choice. And you're going to choose based on what's important to you. So it's, again, it's back to those values. It's not about how you feel about the person. It's you're going to choose based on what's important to you. So in other words, if you are in relationship with somebody and they are requiring that you change, right? They're saying, well, we could be together, but I need you to stop doing this or stop talking to him or stop doing that or cut back your hours at work or whatever it is. If they're requiring you to change, that's a big red flag that they're, that's not going to last. I mean, I know I have a friend and he's, he's kind of like a little brother to me. I've known him for a long time, like a few decades. And I remember going to his wedding and I remember thinking, you know, they, that they did it. I thought at the time that they'd done it right. You know, they dated for a while, they lived together for a while, and then they got married. Well, what happened is once they got married, all the rules changed. Because once they got married, she thought he would give up his dream. She thought he would give up his dream. I mean, it was never a conversation between them. And they had already been together like three years, right? And so what happens is, is we meet somebody, we think we're on the same page with them, but then we never have the conversation to really get on the same page before there's that commitment of a marriage, right? To say, oh, we're really on the same page. We're clear about what's, what's happening here. She made an assumption that he would give up his dream, his career dream, once they got married. And once he was like, oh, no, I'm never giving up on my dream. She was like, oh, well, I can't, be in, I can't be married to somebody who's so unstable, right, in their career choice. And so they had to part. So it's really important, right? Don't let the feeling override it and look at who that person is. Again, if, you're, if you require that that person fundamentally change in order for you to want to be in relationship with them, that's not a good fit. Or if somebody's requiring that you fundamentally change yeah. that's not a good fit either and that just means that you're not a good match so when you find the person that you have that spark of attraction with you're like check right you enjoy spending time together you 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 fit together right it, it feels right together there isn't this pressure like it should feel easy it should feel easy and it won't always feel easy but the, at the beginning i promise you it should feel easy at the beginning. There it, shouldn't no. be a whole bunch of challenges and you shouldn't be climbing mountains and jumping through hoops of fire to be together at the beginning. At the beginning, it should feel easy. It should have that romance phase. And that romance phase is like a, it's like a buoyancy yeah. that carries the relationship through past the power struggle. And you need that romance phase there. So you need that spark of attraction. You need to know that you have shared values, which you only discover after spending time with somebody. And you shouldn't require that that person change or they shouldn't require that you change. And then you choose each other. That's how you know beyond a shadow of a doubt when you're able to look at the person and say, oh, I see who you are. I see who you are. And the things that, you know, those little annoyances, well, that's all they are. They're not fundamental things. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, we had, um, we had our entryway redone a few years ago, and we made a, a shoe off policy in our house. And I recognized pretty quickly that the entryway then became the shoe closet because all of the shoes were piling up at the door. And so, yeah, I got a shoe rack by the door and that's fine. But then the shoe rack got full and it overflowed onto the floor. 
And so I started this thing where when I was putting my shoes away, I would ask Matthew to put his shoes away. And I'd say, hey, you know, baby, can you, I'm putting my shoes away. Can you put some of yours away? And he'd be like, yeah, yeah. And then one time I realized, you know, like, is he ever going to just decide to take his shoes back to the closet? And what I realized was, was no, because I am married to a guy named Matthew Walters and it doesn't bother, like it doesn't fundamentally bother Matthew Walters if all the shoes are are in the in the foyer in the entryway like it's not going to suddenly bother him because it bothers me it bothers me I'm Orna we are two different people and so I decided that I was going to change this because I was like in my mind I was like what is it going to take for him to put his shoes away and I realized oh he's never going to suddenly decide that that bothers him and the only way for me to not have his shoes overflowing from the shoe rack onto the floor is if I wasn't with him. And I don't want that. I would never not want to be with him. So I decided that I would put my shoes away when I put his shoes away, because I'm already making the trip from the foyer to the closet. So I'd grab some of my shoes and I grab some of his shoes and I put them away. And so he knows where to find his shoes. I don't have a problem in the entryway and I get to be with the person I love instead of expecting that person to be bothered by the things that bother me right? Because that's just like a tiny little nothing about how we harp on this thing and we want it to be important to our partner simply because it's important to us, right? And that's not a values mismatch because Matthew and I are very much a values match. This is just like a little annoyance thing. And yet we let those little annoyances build up and build up and create strain on a relationship. And so how do you know if you, if you are really choosing somebody come what may is when you're able to look at that person and you say, Oh, you know what? I don't, I don't want to not be with you. I don't want to not be with you. So these little teeny annoying things, well, let's find a way to work around those things, right? Let's find a way to work around those things. But fundamentally we're on the same page. We're on the same page about the things that we like. The compatibility is there. The chemistry is certainly there and we choose each other. And so we work through the challenges together that come our way. Okay. Uh, so how do you know without a shadow of a doubt? One, you don't decide just based on feelings because feelings change. Two, you notice his behavior because that tells you what's important to him. And three, ultimately you realize that love is a choice and you choose someone because they're a good match for you because you have chemistry, you have shared values, all these things we've been talking about. Okay. How do you get out of your own way so ultimately love starts to flow to you? Because that's really what we all want to be. We want to be in the flow. So first off, you're blocked because of negative emotional stories from the past. We all are. We all have negative emotional stories from the past. We're going to get deeper into this as we you know, continue on. But it's these old emotional stories that block us, that keep us stuck. Some of our blocks are because of events that we experience as adults. You know, we yep. have you know, we have partners who cheat on us. We have partners who die. We have bad things happen. It's part of life, right? And so we decide because of these events, well, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. And then we create a set of criteria and a whole situation that boxes us in and keeps us from really seeing the possibilities that are there for us. And what we want to say is this, your biggest blocks to love come from your early childhood. They come and they originate from your family of origin. Exactly. So you're not a, well, you, I'm not, you're not, you are, you're a complex being and it's not one thing that's keeping you stuck. It's not one behavior. It's not one belief system. It's a system that's blocking you from the love you desire. And we call that system your love imprint. And understanding your love imprint is really the key. Yeah. We want to really um, explain why this is your primary block to having the love that you want, right? We were talking about this concept, right? Nothing has meaning except the meaning you give it and how that signal from the subconscious mind when something is familiar, that there's a charge on that person. It's familiar, it's familiar, it's familiar. So think of it this way. Every experience you've ever had fits inside like the known box in your mind, right? Every experience you've had is something that's known to you. So the job of all of those things that are an automatic pilot for us, right? All of those things in our subconscious mind that we learn are, are these habits of how we learn to do things. They're des by design, they're meant to keep us alive, 
right? Our entire system, our entire being, right? From our reflexes to our, to our behaviors are all about keeping us alive. And so we want to keep things the same. It's like this idea of homeostasis, right? Let's think about this physically. Physically, it's really easy to see that physically we exist in this, like this really narrow strip of temperature, of heart rate, of all of these things and functions of our body. Well, our subconscious mind is also committed to a homeostasis. And what it wants to do, because you're alive right now on, what is it, July the 15th, right? Because you're alive right now, July the 15th of 2017, your subconscious mind is driving you to have more of the same exact experiences that you've had before because you're alive. So because you survived those things in the past, it just wants to bring you more of what's familiar. It says, this is familiar, so, and we've experienced this before, so it must be good because you're alive. And anything you've not experienced before, it considers on some level, not so much bad, but it considers it unsafe, even if it's something that you think you want. Like if you've never had a thriving, lasting love relationship before, it's in your unknown box. And so even on some level, that is considered unsafe. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So the way that we process, the way we can judge whether something is good for us or bad for us, that doesn't happen in the subconscious mind. That happens here in our big prefrontal cortex, right? Well, we've all heard this saying, you can't argue with a four-year-old. Well, you can't, can't reason. reason with a Sorry, you can't you reason. You can certainly argue you with a four-year-old. Four you can certainly argue with a 4 can't reason with a four-year-old. And that's true because a four-year-old doesn't have the capacity to reason. Right, the way our mind develops developmentally, we are not able to reason until after the age of eight or nine. And so your love imprint is formed before that. Your love imprint is the system of how you learned love in your family of origin. So this is why in intimate relationship, you can show up like a, somehow like a different person in a way, right? The way that you're showing up like your friends can say, oh, you know what? You, you behave differently in your intimate relationships. You're not that way with me, right? Or your boss at work or your coworkers. They see you as almost like a different person. It's because the way you learned about intimate relationship is in your family of origin. And those strategies and those mental emotional patterns, all of those things are locked into your subconscious around this system. It's like your, your GPS for love. It's like, this is what love feels like and looks like and smells like and all of that to your subconscious mind. And it wants to bring you what's familiar because you're alive today, not because it's like, oh, brought you the most joy or the most happiness. So let's ultimately look at the pieces of your love imprint. Now, your love imprint is a system in your subconscious, like Gordon's been saying, and it's how you learn to receive love in your family of origin. It's made up of your limiting beliefs, around love, relationship, around yourself, your mental emotional patterns, those habits and patterns of how you are in the world. We all have emotional habits or emotional patterns of how we react to certain events. And then it's also made up of your behavioral strategies. What are the strategies you learned as a kid for feeling loved and how are you using those strategies now as an adult and are they actually working for you or not working for you? So it's your limiting beliefs, your mental emotional patterns and your behavioral strategies. So, you know, the truth is your thoughts are only on the surface, right? But deep down our behavior on the subconscious level, it has positive intent. It's trying to get us something that we need to feel loved, to feel safe, to feel approved of, to feel whatever it is that we need to feel. And the thing is, is our behavior is like on, on an autopilot, right? It's just this thing that happens. And so the program that's running is in your subconscious mind. Like we said before, your conscious mind doesn't decide, ooh, I'd like to have the spark of attraction with this person and not with this person. It's something that just happens. It just occurs. It just happens. And you have that spark of attraction. Well, it's happening because of your love imprints, because of what's locked away in your GPS for love, your, your behavioral strategies, your mental, emotional patterns, your belief systems around what's possible for you around love and relationship based on your past experiences. Your conscious mind does not decide who you have that spark of attraction with. Just like that guy who on paper should be a good match and you go on that first meet and you're like, meh, I mean, nice guy, but no spark. Yeah. So ultimately, 
as a child, what we need to feel more than anything is we need to feel loved and we need to feel safe. And we'll take on any belief, any behavior, any strategy that allows us to feel loved and safe in our family of origin. So whatever that dysfunction was, sometimes it's subtle. You just have parents who maybe aren't good at expressing how they feel or letting you know that they love you. Or maybe you have some more dramatic events like an Ornus childhood. Whatever those are, we react to them by developing strategies and behaviors and beliefs which allow us to feel on some level loved and safe. And those are the strategies that unless we're conscious and we're on this path of learning and growing about ourselves, those are the strategies we continue using as an adult to try to get the love that we want. And those strategies don't work, right? Because they're based on a, a little child's understanding of the world and yourself. Yeah, I mean, when you think of it that way, it's like a four-year-old is choosing who you have the spark of attraction with, right? That's not the part of you that you want doing the choosing, right? Exactly. That's not the part of you that's going to make for a good match if you're going off of that. So your love imprint, as we've been talking, it lives in your subconscious where all the things you learn to do and run are now on autopilot, like tying your shoe or driving your car. Yeah, and the other thing about it is that your um, your subconscious has this idea about what is familiar, but it doesn't speak to you in like English or French or Swahili. It doesn't speak this kind of um, languaging, right? You're, it's not like, in other words, I can't say to you, you know, Jane, hey, Jane, subconscious, we want you to choose a different kind of guy, right? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't, it's not, we're not doing anything. So you can't talk your way into changing. If you think that talking about your love imprint is going to shift anything, boy, you, you're, that's not the way to create transformation. If you want to create transformation, then you have to go deeper and access the subconscious mind with the tools that actually connect with it so you can create change. So. But the first step yeah. is about having awareness right? Awareness of the system, knowing what's working for you towards getting you what you want and what's not working for you towards getting what you want. It's like when you learn to drive a car, right? What's the first thing that you do? You get in the driver's seat. You cannot drive the car from any other seat. You have to be in that driver's seat. And awareness is like getting in the driver's seat. Awareness puts you in the position to create change. Now, you haven't created any change yet because you haven't gone anywhere yet, but you can't drive, can't create change from any other seat. You've got to be in that driver's seat first. And that's why awareness is the most important part. We call that the you are here spot on your map, right? If you don't know where you are, you can find where you're going on the map, but if you don't know where you are, you don't know how to get there. So understanding your love imprint is that you are here spot on the map. Okay. And the truth is this system is completely unique to you. Yeah, it's as unique as your fingerprints, right? Out of nearly 7 billion people on the planet here, um, only you have your fingerprints, even identical twins have different fingerprints. I'm actually a hand analyst and I read fingerprints to look at the soul's journey, right? Who you are at your highest and best self. And those, uh, those life lesson arenas, those challenge arenas, those blind spot arenas that are cyclical, right? And so as a professional hand analyst, we really get a whole sense of your personal journey and your roadmap. Your love imprint is also unique, right? The system of your love imprint is unique to you. Certainly you might resonate with somebody else's love imprint, but only yours is functioning the way it functions with all of those parts, the limiting beliefs, the mental emotional patterns and the behavioral strategies. It's a system that's yours, that you created as that little child growing up in your specific family of origin. And so all of these concepts and ideas, like Matthew and I shared earlier, right, this idea for me, right, that I was unlovable, started in my family of origin, right? Matthew's around how I'm going to screw it up, right? That was unique to him and his family of origin. And maybe you relate to those, but the way the system plays out, your behavioral strategies, I bet they're going to be different, even if you relate to our specific wounds. So the system itself is unique to you. And that's what we're talking about for a love imprint. It's the whole system. It's not just looking at one part of it. It's the whole thing. And because you're a whole being, we're looking at that whole piece of what's serving you and what's not serving you. So the questions you want to ask yourself is, are you willing to do what it takes for you? 
to create soul satisfying, long lasting love? Are you really willing to step up and figure out that system and then do the work to transform it? So what you require to transform your love imprint may be different than what someone else needs. You know, other programs that are out there, other programs about love, dating, relationship, they focus mostly on things like having a positive mindset uh, and, and con you know, uh, actions like how to flirt uh, or how to be more confident, what to wear. And, you know, unfortunately, most of them are really cookie cutter. And they might work in like drawing somebody in, right? But what we want to say is this is what's the point of bringing somebody in if it's not actually going to last? right? Because you've all been there before, right? You have all this hope, right? You go, you have this spark and you're hoping that it's going to be the one for you. Well, when you transform your love imprint, it's not just working on hope anymore because what happens is a whole transformation from the inside out. So a new kind of man is attractive. You can make a whole new kind of decision, not as like that little girl that was growing up in your family of origin that needed to feel loved and safe, but as a grown woman about what feels good for you and about who is a good match for you because now your heart and your head are in harmony they're in alignment and you can really evaluate if someone is a good match or not and it's making that choice right who am who am i going to choose right who are you going to choose to get to that place with and make that commitment and say oh i can choose you and they're also choosing you so it's a match together for that long lasting soul satisfying love so that you can make it through whatever life throws your way with that person, right? So it's not cookie cutter. There's no one size fits all. So if you're ready to discover what specific love strategies that are keeping you blocked from love, we have a special opportunity for you. You can have us diagnose your unique love imprint. Exactly. And understanding this gets you on in the driver's seat, gets you your you are here spot on the map and gets you really started in the right direction to finally changing this story. So what you happens when you transform your love imprint is you find a whole new kind of man attractive, one who's actually good for you, one that you can actually create soul satisfying, long lasting love with. Um, your ex doesn't trigger you or hold a charge for you. We've, we've done this process so many times of releasing somebody from a past relationship so that that person is once again, someone that they just used to know and not this person they carry this torch for. And there's something neat that happens too. Like let's say you're divorced and you share children with somebody and they're triggering you like crazy and you have to see them because you share a child or children together. Well, then you could start to use your ex instead of as that person that's triggering you, you start to see them and sort of as a measuring stick because they're going to measure your growth and they don't trigger you and you don't have a charge on it anymore. And you can focus on raising your child and not be triggered by your ex. So you can either not be triggered by your ex and release that person and move on altogether. But if you have to stay connected because of children, well, guess what? That's so freeing to be able to just sort of laugh inside at your ex doing the same old behavior that used to trigger you, but you've got nothing on it anymore. And again, it's not something you can fake. It's just a whole new feeling inside. Because when you shift your love imprint, you shift in a certain way to be in alignment because now your head and your heart are on the same page. And so those, those old triggering points aren't there. You get to feel comfortable in your own, in your own skin, right? You, you get to feel like, oh, I can finally be myself in relationship. And ultimately, you possess the skills to make love last. So let's give you some examples of people who've done this. So Katarina worked with us, and they were married on October 2nd of 2016. We were actually guests at their wedding. It was so awesome. And Katarina said this to us. She said, I'm beyond happy that after coaching with you, my prayers were answered. Now I have my guy and all the tools to make love last through the years. And thank you just isn't enough. I want to shout from the rooftops how happy I am now. Yep. And uh, oh, it was such a joy for us to be at their wedding together. You know, here's some more real results, testimonials. Um, Felicity and Charles, this is a picture on this very special place for the two of them. They got engaged Christmas Day 2012, one month shy of a year from when she started coaching with us. And Felicity thanks us profusely for our support in creating her dream life as her beloved and their son, who actually his birthday is in June. I believe he turned three last month. And she said this, she said, Charles being in my life makes every part of my life more valuable. Working with you was the best investment I've ever made. 
Uh, and then we have Debbie and Debbie says, this is a picture from her wedding. She says, I'm very happy to say that I have found my beloved. I'm so glad to have completed the Love on Purpose course. The techniques and suggestions are bang on the buck. Thank you both for the help, support, and sharing your experience and journey. You are paving way for many others who are seeking to find true love and happiness. Um, Alyssa, I love this. She says, I met my boyfriend one month after my coaching program with you was completed. And just the other day, I pulled out my list and was flabbergasted. My boyfriend had every single one of the traits on my list that I asked for. And I wasn't even seriously trying to find someone at this point. I just got an absolutely clear on my list. If, if anyone tells me that the law of attraction doesn't work or that there are holes in your process, I don't believe it. Your methods work. Your coaching is excellent. You both catch the little things that have a big impact on relationships and then explain why. Uh, this is Mariev. Um, she decided to coach with us after her boyfriend of four years dumped her out of the blue. She was devastated. She thought she'd missed her chance, not just for love, but to have a, a baby and a family of her own. And here she is. Here's Mariev and her beloved and their baby Antoine, who turned one last year in June. She says this about working with us. I could never thank you enough. When I came to you, I thought I'd wasted four years of my life. Today, I'm living the best years of my life with my beloved, Jean Sebastian. I sometimes have to pinch myself to know I am not dreaming. Thanks to the coaching we did together, I have everything I have ever wanted. Yeah, and I don't know why we have a lot of June babies from our clients, but he turned <laughs> two last month, so yeah. I thought that's cute. I love that picture from his first birthday. Here we have Diane. She says, thank you, Orna and Matthew, for being my love surgeons and helping, helping me clear out all that unnecessary subconscious garbage in my head so I could become the person and partner I consciously want to be for me and my man. And this is a picture of her and her beloved Michael. Okay, so our question for you is, are you next? Do you want to see your picture in this list? Yeah. Um, so a Your Love Imprint session. After we diagnose your love imprint, we can discuss the options to transform it with us based on what you require. Nothing we do is cookie cutter. We'll share with you exactly what we think you need. So here's where to go do this love imprint session with us. Go to yourloveimprint.com. That's yourloveimprint.com. You'll submit a short application. It's only a few questions. You'll get on our calendar and schedule your love imprint session with us. It's only $197. And this is a commitment that you get to make to create your dream life today. We just want to say this. If not now, when? This is the place to get started. Go to yourloveimprint.com. And we want to answer your yeah. questions. So, um, so let's, yeah, let's open it up. If anybody has any yeah. questions about the call today, has any questions about uh, your love imprint or, or, or anything that we shared or anything we shared. Exactly. So let's see some people mark some questions in the Q and a and okay. Those aren't actual. Those are people telling worried. us they can hear us from the beginning. Um, somebody raised their hand, but we don't have that functionality set up for this call. So if you'd rather just type your question into the chat box, thank you. Then we can answer it there. I think that's an easier way to do it. Um, so we'll, I mean, we're just going to sit here for a little bit and see if you have any questions. If not, we'll wrap it up today, but we really would love to answer your questions. So if you have any questions about this whole concept of head versus heart and how you create harmony there, or if you have a question about a love imprint session, we would love to speak with you. It is a private call. It's just the three mm -hmm. of us that end up on the line. You can do it from anywhere in the world. Um, you can dial in uh, via a web call, which is similar to Skype. You just do it via your computer or you can actually dial in, you can get a local number to call in from your actual telephone to speak with us, but you'll get the two of us and you to focus on you and your love imprint so we can see what's really going on and why haven't you been able to create the love that you want. And it's very specific. Again, nothing is cookie cutter. It's all based on what's gone on with you. The, the short application gives us an opportunity to dig deep very quickly in a Your Love Imprint session. And again, we would just love the opportunity to connect with you live so we can really diagnose well, what's really been going on here and why haven't you been successful um, for yourself and how can you be and what is required for you to create that long lasting soul satisfying love where you can choose somebody and they choose you come what may. Okay. So it looks like we're just giving it another minute. It looks like there's no questions. We want to thank everyone 
for joining us today. I'm just going to bring up that URL one last time. It is yourloveimprint.com. So at yourloveimprint.com, you can sign up, you'll fill out the application, uh, and you can get on the phone with us. You can schedule it, and you can schedule it pretty quickly if you're ready to get started. So we're excited to, to talk with a lot of you and find out, you know, diagnose your love imprint and see what your path is to finding that soul satisfying long lasting love. And I just want to thank you yeah. all for joining us today on your Saturday. Um, it would be our pleasure to be of service to you. And we, we sign up a lot of our emails saying we are your guides to love. And, and really that's what we want you to get is we don't give our clients anything that they don't already have. We're just guides to love so that you can have the transformation that you're looking for. So you can make the selection process then leverage it to make a good match, make a good selection for that long lasting love. And you can get out of those old habitual patterns and really switch things up and have the transformation you're looking for. So I, there is a question, is, a, is an important question. Somebody typed this in, so I'm just gonna answer it really quick for everyone. Um, does changing your love imprint, is it about using some energy changing techniques that change one's psychology instantly and what are they and are they safe? Sorry for asking, but I've been burned with those techniques. It is not, nope. we're not doing energy work. Um, we're actually doing deep transformational work. We will be working with your subconscious mind and you will actually be participating consciously in the process. So it's not something we do. It's not like we're going to, you know, lay hands on you and poof, take it out or pull the energy out or, or, or do anything like that. You know, we like the woo-woo stuff, but the work we do isn't very woo-woo. It's very... <laughs> grounded in psychology, grounded in the understanding of how the mind works. And so it is actually a process. Anybody who tells you they do something once and poof, it's gone, it's done, is deceiving you. They're, they're, they're not being honest with you about the true nature of transformation. Transformation takes time. It can happen very quickly if you are consistent, but it's not something that happens in an instant. Yeah. So this is not energy work. Thank you for asking that question, by the way. So yeah. we are not doing some kind of energetic anything when we're diagnosing your love imprint. We're really looking at the system and the subconscious mind. It is a, not something that you are passive in. When we do a love imprint session with somebody, we say it like this. When we're ready to start putting suggestions out about the languaging of your specific love imprint, it's our goal to hit the dartboard and we do, right? We'll throw some things out there and we're, we hit the dartboard. But with your feedback on the line, we work our way to the, the bullseye in the dartboard. And you know, every now and again, we get lucky and we land on that bullseye straight out the gate. But more often than not, we start tweaking the language and we give you a real clear way to know that we have the language right. And so that's how we're looking at this system of what's serving you and what's not serving you. And then if you want to go further down the road and transform your love imprint with us, we can share specifically about what we think it would be required for you to transform it. Because again, there, we just don't do anything that's a cookie cutter program. Our, most of the coaching work that we do is very skilled and selective. Like a, you know, I, I love that Diane in her testimonial, Diane Waldman, she says, thanks for being my love surgeon. So it's not a love surgeon, like an energy, you know, like a psychic surgery or something like that. It's more like we're love surgeons because we're working with the subconscious mind in, in the language of the subconscious using symbol, image, story, and metaphor. We go through um, the body as a metaphor for what's happening in your subconscious, but these are practical tools. They're sort of hands-on tools. We do coach over the phone. Your love imprint is on the phone. You don't need to travel anywhere. And um, we do a lot of these sessions and I'll be honest, you know, we're halfway through the year. I don't know how many more times we're going to offer a love imprint session in this calendar year. We have a lot of programs coming up through the rest of the year. So, you know, I don't want to say, I, I, I'm not saying it from the place of hurry up now. I'm just saying if you're somebody who wants to get started with us sooner rather than later, then I would jump on this opportunity. Yeah, just, now is a good time. You know, but on the, on the other side of things, we don't, we don't do a, hey, act now or else because I'll just, you know, this is our life's work. We're not ever going to stop doing this work. So if not now, you will have the opportunity at some point in the future to do a love imprint session with us. I just don't know how much, how many more of these we're going to do in this calendar year of 2017. So if you're somebody who wants to commit to this sort of work and take that first step of getting in the driver's seat of awareness and really understand the system that's been working 
not in your favor, right? Let's put it that way. And that a love imprint match has a strong charge to it, right? When you're, when you have a strong charge on somebody that's not a good match for you, we call that a love imprint match, which is not a soulmate connection, right? That soulmate, that beloved connection is somebody where you grow together and you inspire one another to grow and you become, um, you know, together you, you move towards your highest and best self. A love imprint match is somebody where the charge is there because it's familiar and it's a charge on the wound saying, this is familiar, this is familiar, right? Like my, um, my ex-boyfriend who had beat me, right? Love and pain were connected from my childhood. So I had a really strong charge on him. It was my subconscious saying, love and pain are connected here. Love and pain, love and pain. Here's a chance for you to have more love and pain but I didn't consciously understand that. I went with the charge thinking, oh my gosh, this is the one. And so that love imprint match can be super deceiving. And so understanding how your love imprint and the system of your love imprint, how it works for you, how it's set you astray in the past, specifically, not in general terms, but specifically for you, is what we do in a love imprint session. Okay. Somebody's asking how long is the session? Um, it's, I think it's originally scheduled for 30 minutes, no, but it's 45, 45, you give yourself 45 minutes to an hour. We tend to overgive, as you can see, we're going on two hours on this call. Yeah. We tend to always do a little more than what we say we're going to do in the first place. So give yourself an hour, even though it'll, it'll ask you to schedule for 45. The cost is $197. And somebody's asking you visit on Skype and we use um, something. It's uh, you meet us on our conference line. So it's like a Skype. It's a web call system where you dial in through your computer. You can do it that way. We also, the same system allows you to get a local dial in number. So you can dial in via your computer or you can dial in via telephone, but we are on the line. But we won't together. be on camera. It'll just be the audio. Yeah. It's just the audio, like a telephone call. Um, and that way, you know, you don't have to put on makeup and get all dolled up and neither we do we. <laughs> yeah, neither do we. Uh, so our last question here, what do you think about when you've done a lot of work and are still not having the breakthrough you've worked hard to create? Uh, you know, I'll be honest, that is our ideal client. That's the person that we work with. We like to say this, we are the last stop on the personal growth bus line. We work with people who, who say, look, I've done everything else and I haven't gotten what I wanted. That's, that's where we're in our sweet spot because there's something about the combination of the way we work that gets to the core of what's really going on. We like to do really deep, powerful inner work. And so if you're somebody who's like already very aware of your stories and your patterns, and yet you're not getting the shift you want, then, then we would highly encourage you to get on the phone with us because we know we can help. Yeah, um, and I think one of the other reasons why, or another way to say it, I mean, just mm -hmm. to sort of plus what Matthew said is if you've done a lot of work, but you haven't had the breakthrough, like the transformation you're looking for, then that means we don't have to spend a lot of time with the understanding and awareness side of things. If you're aware of the problem, but you haven't been able to create the transformation and the change, then we can help you do it that much more, you know, that much faster. So in other words, if you haven't done a lot of work, we're probably going to start getting you into the understanding and observer and really understanding the concepts of why you are the way you are. If you've done all the work that has you understanding why you are the way you are, then we'll pick up there and run with it from there so we can go deep very quickly and create the transformation piece so you can actually have the breakthrough. You know, I want you to think of your love imprint and that spark of attraction in another way because we've all had this experience where we walk into a room of a few hundred people we've never met before, right? We walk into that room and we automatically connect with some people and we don't with the majority of people in the room, right? And so those could be, you know, men or women or whatever. It doesn't matter. We just, we have that recognition. We kind of smile, we connect eyes. And with some of those people, we start a conversation. And yeah, the majority of people in the room are like the, like the extras in our own personal movie, right? You know that they're there, but they're not highlighted. They're kind of, gray and in the background. So what's doing that is in a sense, your, that, that part of your subconscious mind is looking for things that are familiar to you. So when you have that spark of attraction with somebody, um, it's usually created from your, a love imprint match, meaning it's from the wound that you have from childhood. Once you come out the other side and you transform your love imprint, 
what happens is, is some of those people that used to be gray and in the background, they were like the extras, they get upgraded to like a starring role in your movie. And those guys that it didn't work out, like those unavailable, all those guys that, you know, whatever your pattern has been, they get downgraded. They're not highlighted anymore. It's not that they're not, a, they're not in the room. It's just, you don't see them. They're not standing out anymore. They get downgraded to the extra position where they're kind of gray and in the background. And the new kind of man shows up for you. And we've had a lot of clients that often say, oh my gosh, I'm with my guy. And what's funny is we've known each other for years. You know, we didn't, we've, we were in the same circles or we, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing where there's a shift on the inside and it's you that has the shift in the way you're filtering the world so that an ideal match can show up for you. In other words, we, we have, the, I'm going to say it another way. I'm going to say it another way so that more people can understand what we're talking about here. We all know that a, a hallucination is seeing something that isn't there, right? Like a mirage, right? I, that you're seeing something that doesn't, isn't actually there. But when you, when you're, when there's a love imprint match, or if you're struggling finding somebody who is that, that healthy connection, not the wound connection, right? The, the dream connection, like if we're going to say connect, not from your wounds, but from your dreams, right? From your goals and your desires, that kind of man exists for you. But it's like, a, it's, we call it a negative hallucination, right? So hallucination is seeing something that's not actually there. A negative hallucination is not seeing something that's right in front of you. It's like, it's literally right in front of you. It's this thing that's right in front of you and you don't see it. And so oftentimes when there's a mismatch towards your head and your heart, like we've been talking about today, it's creating this negative hallucination where you don't see the thing that's right in front of you. And when you have your love imprint transformed after it's diagnosed and identified, then we can do some deep work to shift that transformation so that you can now see the thing that's been there all along. And you're like, oh, now I get it. So it's a transformative process. So this one love imprint session um, doesn't, isn't about having the transformation. It's about having the identification. And from there, because everybody is different, we can, we can actually let you know, well, here's, here's what we think it would take for you to have this transformation. So if with us, right? So we have a lot of different ways that you can transform it. If you want to know clearly what's been happening with you, this is a place to start, right? Go to yourloveimprint.com. Yeah, just show that one last time. Go to yourloveimprint.com. Once again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's been really just such a joy to be here with you. And we're so grateful for you. And have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank Bye you. for now. Bye for now.